just kind of stretch a little bit. Don't get hell here. Go take your jacket off. Is everybody, I trust you had a good day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. I know many of you have had busy days today. and it, it is difficult to get out here on Tuesday nights, but uh, I do appreciate you coming. And I don't want to waste your time. And in regards to what happened today, just get in the mind frame that you're going to focus and you're going to receive what God has for you. Hello, Tab. And here's the thing. You could always, if you catch yourself going to sleep, just say, Amen, or Hallelujah. That it might wake you up too. It might, might get me going as well. But let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for today. Your many blessings. And we just thank you for each and every one's willingness and desire and hunger to get to know you on a more and deeper, on a, a more and deeper intimate level. Um, their hunger for your word. And Father, you, you say that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So we thank you, Father, that they're leaving here full tonight. We thank you for inspired utterance in preaching and teaching and through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we just yield ourselves to your will and may your will be done in the service. And Father, if there's anything specific that needs to be known tonight, needs to come out, anything specific, Father, we thank you for revealing to that to, to myself or to somebody here to assist and to speak edification, exhortation, and comfort into the lives of our brothers and sisters and your sons and daughters. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, you may be seated. We've been talking about vision, and you might be saying, I was actually a guy at work, he's a minister, and he said, vision, how long have you been speaking on vision? And I got to thinking about that, and I think I've been teaching along the lines of vision since about last July, maybe, okay. maybe even June. So we've almost went, <laughs> and we'll probably get to one year, we're just going to wait and, and, and spell, but actually, the more I get into it, the better the sermons get. Um, so just stick with it. And wait, so why are you teaching so much on vision? You know, vision is basically, we know what vision is basically. It's God's blueprint, you know, for our lives, what he wants us to do. But it really also will help you to stir you up in your gift and callings, to want to give you desire and stir up that desire to find out what God has for you. And just let you know that where you're at, you're not the only person where you're at. Um, we all have desires, and we're all seeking that those desires be filled. We want God's plan and will done for lives, and that's what vision is all about. So we're going to spend some time just on vision. They're not all the same. We got into the principles of vision. If you remember, the very first one is you have to be directed by clear vision. That's pretty simple. you got to know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. And many people live a visionless life. They have no purpose, no aim. So whatever seems good at the time is what they go with. But God has predestined you for something specific. And when you find that something specific, you'll find you don't dread having to work. It's a joy. And you'll find that there's plenty to do. You will not get bored when you discover God's vision for your life. You'll be busy, but you'll be satisfied. Just because you're busy does not mean that you're overwhelmed. A lot of people are busy, but they're like a hamster on a wheel. They're just going nowhere. But you see, when you do what God has called you to do, you're busy doing the best. And you're actually going somewhere, and you're making a difference that outlives you. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Y'all love that verse. I love that verse, don't you guys? Uh, since that probably the age of 16, this was a verse I memorized, and especially during my time at Ramah, it helped me get through those times because I didn't really understand fully what I was doing there, but today I can see a little bit more clearly um, in, in doing so. Principle number two, where we, we're going to start off today, is you got to know your potential. Everybody say potential. So we're going to talk about potential. When you discover your vision, when you get that clear vision in your life, you also find that you have potential, which is dormant ability, inside of you to fulfill the vision. Meaning God's not going to tell you to do something that you don't have the ability to be able to do it. But potential, we're going to get a little bit more into this, is simply dormant ability. You'll never be successful in your vision until you truly understand what your potential is. And your potential is given to you by God. God gives ability to fulfill responsibility. I'll say it again. I always like things around. 
but God gives ability to fulfill responsibility. When you discover your vision, you'll also discover your ability. You'll find, well, not as only God only called me to do this, but He has also given me the potential, which is my ability when it's activated to accomplish this thing God has called me to do. Um, I use Brennan often as an example, which we have very many, many talented musicians here, and we have an awesome Bethel House Band, when you guys say so. That's not for sure, so I don't know what to say for that. But we are very blessed, but you know, I, we are all talented. I'm just using Brennan as an example. Um, but you know, he had a potential from a child to be musically inclined. Now, I don't, you know, I knew Brennan when he was young. Of course, his mother knows him better than I did, but you know, he went, he knew he had a, a potential and he developed that, poten that potential and we see the ability that he has, you know, not only song songwriting, but also being able to play different instruments and all these things. But you see, that ability was there, you know, from a childhood. It was pre-installed in him, but it was up to him and he fur furthered that ability by what? Going to school, learning how to do certain things. And so, you know, he now produces music and writes music and plays music and sings music beyond the shower. And like some of us, and like Michelle. <laughs> but you know, Brennan's, Brennan's potential, although he came from Steve and Michelle into the natural world, his potential did not come from his mother and father. His potential was God-given. He was predestined to walk in the things that he was walking in. You see, when God created Brennan, he looked down 20, 30 years later, He's seen this church. He's seen me and you. He's seen the need for a worship pastor. And we're so thankful Amy filled that position for some time. And she did great at that. And, but she also recognized the God-given potential and the ability Brennan had. And she said, you know, hey, you know, I, I believe that God's calling him in this position. So he stepped in. And so here we are today. Aren't you glad? I am. Potential is, here we go, if you're taking notes. I know so many of you are. Potential is dormant ability, hidden capacity, untapped power, unreleased energy. I'm going to say it again. It's dormant ability, hidden capacity, untapped power, unreleased energy. It is all you could be but haven't yet become. That's key there. It's all you could be but haven't yet become. That's potential. Meaning potential is there and inside of you lies all the ability that you need to accomplish what God has called you to do. You see, the ability will ask you think. But it's dormant there. Until you get that potential out, it's just in there setting. Our power or potential is at work in us. God put His vision and His Spirit within us, and that's more than enough potential for our need. Now, Ephesians 3.20, did anybody see that little Facebook post I put on our Bethel today? I put it, you know, check it out every now and then. But Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, think about that. It doesn't just say can do a little more. It says what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So God is able. Everybody say God, God. is able. Amen. So we know he is able. But is he will? We'll just keep on reading. According to the power that's work, that's at work where? In us. So God is willing to do more than we could ever ask or think. But and able to start off and start accomplishing some of these dreams, we have to realize that that power is at work within us. It doesn't say that the work's in heaven. Though it came from heaven, though it came from the Father and the Creator of the universe, it says that that power is at work within us. And we know that power, we just talked about, is potential. Is that dormant ability. The power to accomplish supernatural things you possess in your body, but then also the Holy Spirit, who is the guide and He is the teacher. He is also the empower. He is, you find, demonstrated the, the arm and hand of God. He He's who, who works and is about completing Father's business upon earth. He's here to help us and to power us and to anoint us. He's also inside of us. So heaven's will, the ability of God, 
the ability to work in the supernatural is in heaven, but according to the scripture, it's specifically at work within me and you. And we have to realize that we could literally be sitting on a gold mine, so to speak. We all have things that uh, are so much bigger than us, but until we actually start walking out, recognizing that potential and putting works to our faith and, and works to what we know we should do, it's just going to say dormant ability. You have the potential, but there's, if, if you don't act on those things, it's just going to remain dormant. I think we all have heard of athletes, you know, oh man, they have such great potential, but then because of a few bad decisions they make, whether it be in college or high school, they may get in, in trouble with the law or with the school, whatever it may be. They get kicked out of the basketball program or the football program and, and everybody says, man, that, he just had such potential. But because he wasn't willing to, to work towards that and to stay with it and to remain focused on that vision that he had, you know, whether to be a professional athlete, he falls beside the wayside and just becomes a statistic of one of those who doesn't make it to professional sports. You have to stay focused. You have God-given ability pre-installed in you to do great things for the kingdom. This power, as I said, it doesn't come through social class. It doesn't come through your mother and father. It doesn't even come for education. Now, education can facilitate that potential in helping develop it and helping you recognize it. But still yet, it does not come from man. It comes from who? It comes from God. God will do immeasurably or exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask for, think about, or imagine. So, okay, well, how can I have a vision and focus on that if God can do more than I can imagine? You see, that's the thing about God. He's limitless. He's limitless. <laughs> Somebody else say it for me. Yes. The only limit we put on ourselves is the limit we put on God's ability. Meaning, as big as you can dream, God's able to dream and do much more than you can even dream. So it doesn't matter how big you think, God's ways of thinking are so much higher and so much bigger than yours. Now we all have an imagination. You know, see, imagination wasn't given to us to sit around one day hoping we hit the lottery. Or, you know, just things. It's, it was meant to us to give us something to go for, for, for to us to be able to think of things much bigger than ourselves. God built the universe and all that we see with purpose and intent. But it started with a dream. <laughs> well, now specifically, does the Bible say God had a dream? It don't say that. But you find that God created an atmosphere, He created the universe, He created the world, He created the conditions of the world, all for one purpose. And that purpose was for mankind. So He envisioned it, He spoke it, and then it came into being. And when it was ready for His vision, then us, the creation, came into this world. And here we are still today. But it was because he had a desire out of love and we know that love gives love wants to share and he just had a desire to share in his goodness with someone like him so he created mankind in his likeness and in his image and if you remember we talked about that likeness and image likeness is not only to to resemble but also the ability to perform like if you go back into image and likeness. Does not, does not say we are God. does not say that. But we do have the ability, and you find it in the Word. You have the ability to imagine. The only thing that limits you is your imagination and your dream and what you think you can do. If you think you can do it, you can do it. If the Word says you can do it, you definitely can do it. Now, some people think, well, you know, they'll think something, well, I want to play golf. Well, just because you think you can play golf... If you don't have no potential in playing golf, you ain't going to be able to play golf very well. Unless there's some people who has a natural ability, and there's some people who works out to do it. But what I'm saying is, just because you can think, if you're not willing to put some work and effort and focus into that dream, it's still just going to remain out there in a 
unphysical state. But God took his thinking. God thought about it. He wanted children. So he took his thoughts. He put them into words. And then they became a reality. And it's so important to realize that the unseen is more real than the seen. And matter of fact, the unseen created things which are seen. And God's ways, God's kingdom has become unfamiliar with the seen world today. But just because they're unfamiliar with the seen world, the unseen things of God, His ways, His principles, they still work. Now faith is the substance of what things hope for, is the evidence of things not seen. Just because you can't see things in the natural does not mean that they're not real. And when it comes to your dream, though you may not be able to see it right now physically, but you can spiritually in the faith realm take that God-given vision and work toward it, and you'll find that you can achieve, and that it's going to be exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Matter of fact, you'll start off on a vision, and you'll find that as you go in it, it becomes bigger. And it becomes bigger. When I think of men, I think of like Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagen and Will Roberts and men of that sort who was able, God through their lives by vision, by their own mission, has done exceedingly abundantly above all that the guys are saying. But you see, they had to work. <laughs> they had let that power work through them. So, you know, everybody dream big. Everybody say dream big. But you see, you've got to dream big in what God has called you to do. Because that is where the potential is. Like I said, if God never called you to be a musician, if that's not what God has called you to do, you can dream about up here being a rock star or whatever it is you want to do, you know, singing at the k -Love Awards or whatever. But if, that's, if God has not given you that potential, you have nothing concrete to place your faith in. Now, you could... I'm not saying, you know, don't pursue some people just because you don't have natural ability to sing. There have been many people that don't really sound very good singing and been able to make it big. But us, you'll know when you seek God out. He'll tell you and show you what He wants you to do. And as you go walking towards it, it becomes more and more clear. And like I said, it'll enlarge its borders as you do so. But start off in what God has called you to do. And then take that word from Him. Use your imagination dream big, and then God will take you step by step in what He wants you to do. God gave us the gift of imagination to keep us from focusing only on our present conditions. Jeremiah 1.5, the prophet said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, ordained you a prophet to the nations. Notice that these words are past tense. God says, Before you were, not I'm going to, you were. Well, Jeremiah was not so sure about it. He's like, God, are you sure? I don't even know how to speak. Sound like Moses. You know, I'm not very good at speaking. I, you know, I, I've not been uh, cultivated. I've not been groomed to be a speaker. But God, in a sense, tells Jeremiah, don't say that. If I built you to be a prophet, don't tell me that you can't talk. And you see that... In Jeremiah 1.9, the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. You see, God had called to be a prophet. And whatever God calls for, He also provides for. Whatever He requires, He also enables us to do. Don't allow, put this in your mind, put a check mark on it. Don't allow others to judge your potential. Now, just because I say you can't sing very well, if that's, you know, that's your desire, you know, that's your God-given potential. And just because I say you can't sing worth a dime, don't pay no attention to me. It doesn't matter what I say. Why is that? Others may not be able to see your purpose. And your abilities are determined by your purpose. Meaning they can't see the work that God has done inside of you. But God knows. And when He speaks to you and directs you to do something... It doesn't matter your background. Like I said, it doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your college education. If God calls you to do it, and you go forth doing it in obedience to Him, you will succeed. God does not create failures. 
If you are if you are failing, it's because you are success that has gone off track. If you find yourself failing in life, you need to evaluate your purpose and motives and really see if you're walking out God's plan for your life. Everybody say, God doesn't create failures. And that includes all of us. You're not a failure. You are a success. And like I said, if you're failing, it's because you are a success that has got off track. But some people don't recognize. And, well, and some people are harsh. And can I say this also? Not everybody is going to be supportive of your vision and your dream. Matter of fact, the worst is, you know, <laughs> well, talking about some spiritual principles is, is, is about casting your pearls before the swine. Not everybody is going to like your vision. Not everybody's going to accept it. And a lot of people will even become jealous of it. People don't like, and I won't say everybody, but there's a lot of people, especially in the world, and it's sad that it's even in the church, they become jealous of people when they step out into the row and they begin succeeding. And so, why is that? Well, it's because they're comparing themselves to other people and they have the ability and are unique, but they're not stepping out in faith. And you see, when you step out in faith, you're getting out of the norm and the average and the mediocre and stepping up on a higher level. You're going from good to better and what? Better to best. And when you go in and you start living out what God has called you to do, people are going to take notice. Not everybody's going to like your preaching. Not everybody's going to like your teaching. Not everybody's going to like your singing. Not everybody's going to agree with you. Not everybody's going to support you. It's okay. But they are those who you will touch because God knows what He did in you. He knows who's here. And He gave you, he gave you the ability to reach out and be a blessing to those people. And that's what your potential... Potential is not only for your benefit. You'll find that it's for the benefit of others. God used Moses to bring out the Israelites from under the bondage of the Egyptians. That's, that's what Moses' purpose was. And, and it's really an enjoy when we want to get to looking at some of these uh, patriarchs of faith and their lives and just how motivated and, and, and God speaking to them and things they went through that, you know, if, if God would have told them all that they was going to do and how he was going to get them to where they was going before, I would have ventured to say most of them have said, I know thanks, I believe I'll just stay where I'm at. <laughs> Joseph would have probably said, I think I'll just stay at my father's house, you know, tend the sheep. And Moses would have said, yeah, you know what, just, you can have Pharaoh, you can, you, can just, you can have it all, I'll just, just let me be. I get that clip going, just get it up there. Now, how many of you have seen Star Wars? Raise your hands. Oh my goodness. Sonny. I didn't know we had such non-believers in the house. Oh my goodness. Well, whether or not you like Star Wars, like there's a little under four minute clip. Now, who of y'all know who George Lucas is? Lucas Films? Sir? Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, I'm a Star Wars fan. I've watched all of them several times. And... This movie, which it came out even before my time, but 1977, is when it first came out. Now, when this movie came out, it cost about $13 million to make. This was 1977. Today's money, due to inflation, it would probably roughly cost $40 million. So we're going to watch this little clip, and then we'll talk some more about this.
dollars turned into over a $200 billion industry. And as we just saw, he had a problem communicating his vision. If he wasn't an introvert and actually had the ability to communicate his vision the way he saw it, I'm sure other people would got involved, but he was one that just kept to himself, and so therefore he had a hard time getting his vision to other people. But because of his persistence in the face of adversity, like I said, 13 million, it earned 400, this is 1977, it earned 461 million, this is 1977, think about the inflation, in the U.S., and 314 million overseas, totaling 775 million in 1977. It surpassed Jaws in being the highest grossing film of all time, and it wasn't surpassed until late, the movie E.T. came out later. Disney bought Lucasfilms, which includes uh, predominantly the franchise right to Star Wars, in 2012 for a little over $4 billion. <laughs> George Lucas doesn't seem so silly now, does he? The vision he had. But he said, he noticed there in the end, he said, always remembers your focus determines your reality. So he was focused. He wasn't willing to compromise on his vision, even though it set him back 40% more. It, Like I said, all the critics, even his own actors that he had hired, thought this thing is going to be, be, be a big flop. Um, I'm pretty sure the actors are glad now that they stuck with him. Well, you know, some of some of the biggest stars came from that. You look at um, uh, Indiana Jones. What's his name? Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. I mean, that was that was his. You look what his career after that, and, and so many other ones. But the power of vision. Always remember your focus determines your reality. You have to stay focused on what God's do. Not everybody's going to recognize it. Like I said, not everybody's going to be acceptable of it. But just stay with it. You see. Your vision is unique, and not everybody is going to understand what God has placed in your heart to do. Joseph's parents, Joseph's brothers, had a hard time understanding his vision. They didn't like it. They thought it was foolishness. But God brought it to, to God brought it to pass because Joseph was willing to hang on there, hang in there, and be faithful to God and to not give up and not to quit. And there's so many success stories. That's just one of them because I like Star Wars. But there are many, you'll find many of these actors and these CEOs of companies, they started out with an idea, a vision that nobody else had. They worked towards it. They worked against opposition. They worked against lack. <laughs> they worked against all kinds of things. But they didn't let outside forces determine what they saw on the inside of them and their willingness to work toward to make sure that what they could see in their mind, other could see. See, in their mind, they saw something that the world needed. That's If you want to become a millionaire, that's how you become a millionaire. Find something out that the world needs that the world doesn't have. <laughs> that's pretty simple. <laughs> it really is, but that's the truth about it. But they had an idea and they saw something that nobody else saw up to that point. And so they worked toward it. Think about a computer. You know, you think about Bill Gates, you know, the, the CEO, founder, and one of the co-creators of Microsoft. And just how literally, just even third world, third world countries, how they even have access to technologies and to Windows Office. Predominantly every business in the U.S. uses Windows Office. Billions and billions of dollars. Imagine trying to explain to somebody that that somebody at the computer that's, that nobody has ever seen or, or ever thought. Of. And, and, the, and this is possibility of having everybody to have their own personal computer in their own house when this, when this started was unimaginable. It seemed foolishness. I mean, computers would literally take up this whole room. But now... Well, I, you know, I carried one over here. and Well, for that matter, most of you has got one in your pocket even. But that start with a man's vision to do something that nobody else thought was possible or had thought of. That's the uniqueness of our personal visions. Now, here at George Lucas, as I said, he didn't do a good job communicating. But he worked at it and he worked with others to get it through. But we as a body of Christ, 
when we come together and we're willing to support one another's vision, think about this. How much easier is it for us as individuals to complete that and to run our race, to have that support? Imagine if, you know, George Lucas had the backing and he was able to get other people to share in that vision. A lot of people wish they would have shared in that vision at the beginning because I guarantee you if they, could, if they could just see it a couple years down the road, they would have been crawling and begging him and licked his shoes to be able to invest in his movie project. I guarantee you his movie budget would have been unlimited. But others could not see that, but he did. And so $13 million turned into almost a $300 billion return on his investment. That's pretty good. We all have a responsibility for our vision. We as a body of Christ, when we... Now, like I said, be careful who we share with. We, don't, we just don't go around telling everybody. But you see, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be able to come to one another and be one another's biggest supporters. So therefore, Jericho may come to me and say, Brett, you know, it's really upon my heart to do this. And I'm thinking, you know what, Jerrica? That's probably the strangest idea I've ever heard of. You know, Jerrica, I've never heard of that before. That doesn't make much sense to me. But I tell you what, you say God told you, yes. I, I say, okay, well, let me pray about this. And, and you pray about more. Let's make sure it's what God wants you to do. And they pray about it. And, and Jerrica, yes, I'm sure it's what God wants me to do. I say, all right, Jerrica, well, then how can I support you in fulfilling that vision? And it may seem silly, but... You know, if it's a God thing, it's a good thing. And if it's a God thing, it's going to work. I think we'll all agree with that. God is not a failure, and as I said, God does not create failures. So we should actually be supporting one another, and we all should have visions that are bigger than ourselves and are unable to be accomplished simply by ourselves. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ and the way God intended it for God gave you a vision big enough not only for you, but it's so big that you, you alone cannot carry it out. You need the assistance of others. Kenneth Copeland Ministries, multi-million dollar ministry. They do things all over the world. But if nobody got behind their vision for the ministry God had called them to do, they would not be able to do what they're doing today. Take this church, for instance. If... Nobody was willing to get behind and support and, and to contribute and to fulfill their role. I can come up here and minister every Sunday and Tuesday, but it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to go very far. And my role isn't the same as your role, and I've, I'm not going to hit that. that you know, that's pretty much a dead horse. I think you all have been coming on Tuesday nights long enough to know. I've said many times, if God didn't call me to do it, I'm not going to do it. That's not saying I don't do other things else. You know, if I see something needs to be done, I, you know, I'll do it. But I'm not going to get up here on, and sing on Sunday mornings just unless, you know, it would have to be direction from God. And it would have to come from him. And you all probably glad. Well, I can sing all right. I'm not, I'm not horrible. But they, trust me, nobody's asked me to join Bethel House Band. I'll put it back at. Me <laughs> but responsibility is really respondability. It's respondability, or the ability to respond to the requirements of your vision. You've got to do something with it. Your ability isn't dependent on what you perceive as your limitations. You are perfect for your purpose. God appoints, anoints, and distinguishes people. He doesn't want us to live like everybody else. And He gives us our dreams to get us out from underneath the mediocrity of life and to reveal our true selves to the world. And when the world sees me and you, they should see Christ. They should see a supernatural being who's working and doing things that no human being alone in his own power can do. Jesus was a man, but he was also the Son of God. He was a part of the Godhead. But yet, the Word says Jesus stripped himself of all authority and power and came in the form and in the power of a mere man. And so he, we know, was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit without measure, he performed miracles, did many signs, wonders, wisdom, 
operated and spoken wisdom and, and knowledge that nobody up to that time had been able to operate. Even though scholars were amazed of the things they saw. Many didn't understand him, so many feared him. But we find that there were more who ran to him than who ran away from him. But we know he, he was crucified, thank God for that. Satan thought he was doing something there. But everywhere he went, you find what? People thronged him, the Bible says. The crowd just swarmed him. It's because they saw something that was not ordinary. They saw the supernatural. God told Abraham, what? Come out. He told Moses, come out. He told David, come out. Now, I'm not talking about coming out of the closet here. He told him, come out of his homeland. God, God ain't for anybody coming out of the closet. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that right now. He loves everybody. You know, sin is sin. But God is, the, the, that's not a God thing. But he was telling them, come out from among the normal. Come out and be separate. What is the word, you know, the word talks about us being what a peculiar people. And for us, that we're no longer in the world. But to come out under the world's influence. Operate not under a worldly kingdom, but under a, my kingdom, God's kingdom. And do things the way God wants them done. And it's amazing how God's ways don't make sense to the natural man or to the natural mind or to thinking. But God gives you a vision. You meditate on that vision. You start talking about that vision. You start acting on that vision. And you'll find success story after success story all because somebody was willing to go forth and not be afraid of failing. And the saying is true, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. That's absolutely true. Many, numerous men and women, hardships, failures, setbacks, have to close businesses, living out of their cars, having to move back in with their parents, whatever it may be, came before being millionaires and even billionaires. But it's persistence to the vision. You have to be persistent. And it's so important that we understand what God wants us to do. And, like I said, you've got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to realize that God's taking you from good to better and better to best. You don't stagnate in God's flow. It's a continual flow. It's rivers of living water. The blessing is always picking up speed. It's always increasing. Your ministry should always be growing. Now, just because it doesn't grow number-wise, still yet in yourself, you should be progressing in your ministry. You should be developing your relationship. Hey, develop your notes. Um, take serious the appointments that you have. Uh, be diligent and faithful in the thing you're doing now. You know, because that's all. You know, God's not, God doesn't forget. He doesn't have a short-term well, thank goodness for a sin. He, he, just, he just forgets about it totally. But God remembers the good things and the seeds that you have sown. He hasn't forgot about them. But the ability to accomplish your vision is manifested when you say yes to your dream and obey God. Y'all remember Nehemiah? We talked about him. Y'all remember? Jericho, you remember Nehemiah? You don't remember Nehemiah? You actually may not have been here. But Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. And he had a prestige position in the kingdom. And you, you might remember the Persians, you know, took over Jerusalem and, and it was all a mess. Well, Nehemiah wanted to build back the wall that was protecting his people. But he was a cupbearer. Now, just being in that position did not give Nehemiah the ability to rebuild the wall. Did not in any way. If he had just looked at his present condition or his present resources and skills, he would have never fulfilled his God-given vision. But yet God placed him in that position for a reason. God knows what he's doing. Amen? And Nehemiah trusted God to write what was needed. So what happened? You know, he goes to, 
to the king and you know the king recognizes he's not his happy old self and king's like Nehemiah you're sad you know what what's up what is it that you want the king so Nehemiah you know hey I want to go and rebuild the wall so what does the king do the king gave Nehemiah letters granting him safe passage to Jerusalem and also the king gave him access to the king's force for the rebuilding of the wall so by Nehemiah being in that position even though in the natural not having no ability to do that but just having a vision from God God created him a connection not only for him to have safe passage to where he needed to go but basically the king paid for the project that's God amen when you don't know where the resources are going to come from where it doesn't seem possible in the natural God always makes a way it's just not always your way <laughs> We want things our way because we're so, we've, we think about it, we live in a natural world. The Bible teaches us, once again, that the unseen is more real than the seen, that God is an invisible God. All things were created visible by things invisible. So you even find in the very beginning of Adam and Eve, what happened? They were not conscious. They had a physical body, but yet they were naked, but with no conception of what naked was. You find that when Adam and Eve see, sinned, what happened? They became body conscious. They became aware of their physical surroundings. No longer God was their sole source. They now had to work. God said because of sin, and guess what? Now you've got to go provide. You've got to work by the sweat of your brow. You've got to go dig and do all these things. You've got to labor and work. Things got difficult because of sin. And so in our mind, we we, we, we got to train ourselves and, I, and, I, and like I said, I drive down the road, and I, I, I believe another minister said it, but I couldn't remember who said it, but it came up. you got to learn to doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. you got to uh, see the unseen more than the seen. <laughs> and you've got to be willing to not be just willing to do your things your way, but just do it the way God wants to do it. And just say, okay. But that's hard for a, a, a body that's grown up in a sensed, ruled world that was dominated by sin and dominated by temptation, dominated by wrong thinking. We literally, we have to brainwash ourselves with God's Word. And we have to totally change and transform the way we think and the way we see things and what we say about things. It's a transformation, but it starts from the inside out. And you all know this because I've taught on this before and others before me, that your spirit, you live in a body and possess a soul. Your spirit is perfect. Your spirit is born again, but you still got stuff to do with your mind and you still got to work out things in your flesh. And until you do those things, the hidden man of the heart is going to stay hidden in you. But so since then, men has always craved for something, a longing on side of them that nothing on the outside world or the physical world could fill that void. But only God, hallelujah, only God could fill that void in the presence of just, just in everyone's life. <laughs> but so many people are being deceived and being deceived and running here and there, even Christians. Why? Because they still don't understand about God's principles and the unseen being more on the scene. They're flesh dominated. As Paul put it, cardinal Christians. Being flesh ruled instead of spirit ruled. We are to be ruled from the invisible to the visible. From the unseen to the seen. It starts from the inside out. A tree can be dead on the inside, but it can take a long time for its effects to show up on the outside. We're alive on the inside. Alive unto Christ, dead in the sin, hallelujah. But how many people, I don't want to go on this on Sunday, how many Christians are still under that condemnation and under that power of sin? Now, I'm going to tell everybody, please invite, if you know people lost, or you know young Christians, or yourself, invite people Sunday. I'm going to minister on sin for probably a few, several Sundays. 
And this isn't a bug hunting sermon. Just take a little side note here. It's not a bug hunting sermon. Meaning, I'm not going around just finding faults in each and every person. That's totally not what this message is about. This sermon's about sin, what it is, the power it has over the world, and the power it has over the church, which is none. But it's not a message to point out sin, or it's not a message to condemn or to convict. It's a, it's a message to empower and to help you to realize what God has done on the inside so that what is inside can come to the outside. That's what these messages are going to be about. So a little heads up. Sometimes I hear some people say about sin, you're like, I don't even know if I want to come to church that day. <laughs> you know, somebody get up here and me tell you, you know, you're wrong, you're wrong, and what you're doing is wrong, and you need to be doing this better. That's not going to help anybody. A lot of people already know they're doing wrong or they need to do better. But you see, that's working. Doing that way is trying to work from the outside in. That's not the way it works. Correction comes from the inside and works its way out. But where was I? A little side note. Yeah, here we go. I was talking about vision. Very good, Jerrica. I'm glad he was listening. But you see, the king, the king paid for the project. That's awesome, isn't it? So you may not be totally happy where you're at job-wise. You might think, you know, why am I teaching Sunday school? I should be up there preaching or whatever it might be. You don't know what God is preparing you for and the connections you're making where you're at for God to bless you and to further your vision down the road, as in the case of Nehemiah. He was positioned for a purpose. Moreover, the king appointed, I'm wrapping this up, moreover, the king appointed Nehemiah as governor in the land of Judea so that he had the authority to carry out the reconstruction of the wall. That's a good thing. He still received opposition, but if he didn't have the king's blessing, it would have never started. He'd have been shut down before he even began. Seed. 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 Every seed has the potential to become a tree. Right? We'll all agree on that. The potential for a tree is in the seed. But till that seed's planted and is in the right environment, they won't become a fully grown tree. But if you put them in the right environment, plant them, they'll eventually become what God put in them. And it's their potential, which is a tree. And it's the same way with me and you. I can't see, if I'm just going off physical things, what I see, I just see a seed. I don't see much potential there from what I can see. But because of the laws of nature, because I've seen them, because I've been taught them, even though it makes no sense to me, and I don't understand how it works, even though I've, I've had uh, biology and even had some science, you know, I've had science in school. You place that seed in the ground, cover it up, sunlight, water, nutrients from the soil. That little seed, we find that little acorn becomes what? We got back here, it was big old oak trees. Something that small, something massive. I don't understand it. God's word is a seed. I don't understand everything. I don't understand how it all works. I don't. <laughs> I'll be the first one to admit that, and you will too. I don't understand how everything works. But all I know is God says, take my word, plant it in your heart, how do you shower it, meditate on it, water it, tend to the garden, keep the conditions right, you know, come before God, stay in the sunlight of His glorious nature and His presence. And that seed is going to germinate and that seed is going to become so big that you're not going to be able to contain it. And it's going to multiply and produce so much fruit it'll not only be a blessing for your family, but it'll be a blessing to other families. And that's the potential of God's Word. That's the potential of the seed. Plant the seed of your vision by beginning to act on it and then nurture it by faith. Your vision will develop until it is fully grown and bears much fruit in the world. Who's responsible for planting the seed? That's all stand. Very good, Jericho. You've been a good student tonight. I appreciate that. <laughs> all stand. <coughs> we are responsible for the seed. 
We are responsible for tending to the seed. We're responsible for protecting the seed. Who's responsible for causing the seed to germinate and to grow? That's God's responsibility. It's God's responsibility to make sure that His Word works when we believe it and we stand in faith on it. If we plant the seed, if we tend to the seed, God says it'll grow in your life. I plant a seed today. I've said this before. I don't say nothing new. But it's good to be reminded of these things. I plant a seed today, and just because I don't receive a harvest next week, does that mean that the seed isn't working? It does not. It's working. It start, it's, matter of fact, it started working the moment you planted it in the ground. Things started happening. But thank God all things happen in seasons. So, once again, stay in faith. Encourage yourself. Don't lose confidence. Just pray. If you don't know, if you aren't satisfied where you're at, just ask God, God, am I where I need to be? Do I need to be doing something else? What have you called me to do? And if you're happy and perfectly content where you're at, thank God. But God, what do I need to be doing next? What's your next step for me? What should I be doing now to prepare myself for what you have for me down the road? And thank God during the day. God, I thank you for giving me understanding of which doors, for open doors of opportunity, which doors to go through, which doors not to go through. I thank you for divine appointments today. Help me to be aware of and to realize those certain people I need to talk to, the certain places I need to be, where I need to go, whatever, what I need to invest in, where I need to go eat lunch at. Be led in all areas of your life. But God is good. Amen. God is good and His mercies endureth forever. You see, it's 8 o'clock and I'm done. That's a pretty good time, isn't it? I think I'm, I think I'm getting the hang of this thing. <laughs> All right. Potential. Everybody say normatability. Normative. Once again, it's all you could be but haven't yet become. That's what potential is. And we all have it. All right. Anybody got anything else? Anything you want us to pray for? Y'all go and watch Star Wars now, aren't you? Nope. Tap's quick to say no. But I'm telling you guys, if you ain't watched Star Wars, don't watch, don't start off with New Hope. Go to the fourth one, Phantom Menace. Go there, watch. They, they came out backwards. Actually, the first three that came out were four, five, six. Then early like 2000, one, two, three came out. And then seven came out. Then eight just, you know, still, you know, The Last Jedi. That's actually number eight. So. They did it right. Yeah, they did do start from there. Seven and eight. They got seven and eight right. No, they didn't start from there. Oh. Okay. But seriously, Brandon, watch them. They're, they require a huge investment because they're like two, two and a half hours to pay. So it's a pretty big investment. But I've heard some of the shows you've watched and recommended to me and... Trust me, son. All right, but watch Star Wars if you ain't watched it, unless you just absolutely don't like that kind of stuff, but you still might like it. Anything about anything else? All right, well, enjoy the rest of your week. Spring 4, Sunday. So if you normally run late for church, you're going to be very late. As a matter of fact, we may be gone if you show up at the same time this Sunday. So, spring forward Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, starting off just general home groups at Jesse and Amy's house. It's a uh, potluck, so I guess with potluck, good luck. <laughs> I don't believe in luck, but you get what you get. Um, 6 o'clock, invite somebody. Anything else? All right. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.